Here we are, 3-3. Three, three. It's me, Alan, your friendly mathematician slash coach. We're at differentiation rules now that we've taken the first two sections of chapter three to basically define what it is that a derivative and as a function would look like and be. Now we're going to continue on with adding on some rules that have been proven. We'll do a bit of that ourselves. And we're even going to go off of what we just did in 3.2, the last few problems or so that I assigned for you all, and that is recognizing patterns. Uh, we're going to focus on right now polynomial functions, some of the easier. They're continuous everywhere in their domain, so we know that, therefore, the limit and derivative will exist. I gave you 2x minus 5 as one of the functions, and you should have come up with a derivative of two. And then for the other one, g of x, which was x squared plus 3x, you should have come up with the derivative of 2x plus 3. And these are things that eventually, hopefully sooner than later, after this section even, we will be able to look at this and say it's that without having to do the big limit definition. I wanted to just do an exercise with you all so that we can get used to what these things look like. All right, and that is of the basic power functions. X to a power, whether it's one, two, three, four, or any power. Okay, so go ahead and pause it right here. Do me a favor, do the limit derivative definition on each and every one of these until you find a pattern and think that you can just come up with the derivative of the next. Because our goal is going to be to try to figure out what the derivative would be for any form of x to the n. All right, so go ahead and pause it here, attempt to find the derivative of each and every one of these using the limit, and then we'll make sure that we provide a definition that x to any power, its derivative can be written as a certain way. All right, good luck. So hopefully you were able to remember what the definition was. Remember it's or f of x plus h minus f of x all over the h as our distance between the two x's, our h approaches zero. So for this as our function, we will replace the x with x plus h, and then the original function, which is x. And what happens is when we subtract, they cancel out, and we're just left with h over h, which simplifies to be a one, so since direct substitution does not apply to a constant because there aren't any more variables that are still there, our answer will always be one. If you got that, go ahead and pause, try the next one. This one requires a little bit more, but here it is for you. X plus H is what we're gonna replace the X with. And that would then therefore be squared minus the original function. So we actually have to expand this and be careful when you expand a binomial. Remember, you're going to actually end up with the trinomial. X squared plus the two XH. Some students will leave that part out and only square each piece, which is incorrect. And what happens when we subtract the X squared from the X squared, those cancel out and we're left with things that only have H, which makes sense. If you guys think about what this was trying to find, remember was the slope between two points and we move those two points so close together that the gap between them was really 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 small in other words approaching zero and so if you take x plus a little bit and you subtract the original then the only things that should be left is the little bit that h now remember we tried direct substitution with limits whenever we can but the zero in the denominator is an issue so what we're going to do is factor out an h out of each of those to be left with just a 2x and just one now h and that allows us to cancel out the denominator which leaves us with no issue on bottom so now we can use direct substitution and make that approach or become so close to zero it's like we're adding nothing and that leaves us with an answer of 2x. So notice we had x to the first here, and we ended up getting an answer of 1. Here we had x squared, ended up getting an answer of 2x. 
Go ahead and pause it and see if you can write down what you think the derivative of this is going to be before actually working it out. See if you can find that pattern. Hopefully you came up with 3x squared because this is starting to get laborsome. Now, again, I try to color coordinate everything so that you could see every step along the way, as in the original derivative is my x plus h cubed, because that's what we're replacing x with is an x plus h, and then minus the original all over h. Cannot use direct substitution because that gives us a zero on bottom, so we must expand this, which again, you've studied binomial expansions, either using Pascal's or the binomial theorem, and you should have gotten this, which then allowed us to cancel out the x cubes. And because each of these terms have an h in them, we're able to factor that out. And we're left with 3x squared plus now just 1 3hx plus now h squared. And because that h is being multiplied, we know that anything divided by itself is 1. And 1 times anything will stay that thing. So we can go ahead and cancel the h's and now directly substitute in for the h's that are left to approach or become 0. So the only thing that is left is 3x squared. And hopefully you get the idea and you see the pattern. What then would you tell me the derivative of this would be? Now that you've seen x to the first became 1 x squared became 2x, and x cubed became 3x squared. Can you see the pattern that would yield a derivative 4x cubed for x to the fourth? Hopefully you were able to come up with that. If not, you can go ahead and work that one out just like the others. It's going to get more and more laborsome because the powers are getting higher and higher. So our goal is to figure out what the derivative f prime of x would be if f of x is equal to x to the n, any power, the power function. If you notice the pattern, then you came up with a little thing we're going to name the power rule because of the power function. So anytime we have x to a power, we will take that power and bring it down in front, and we will have one less up top. If you didn't see that pattern, check it out now. If I have x to the first, I bring that down in front and subtract one. I now have one x to the zero, which remember anything to the zero power is just one. Doing that with all the others, x squared, we bring that down and then subtract one. x cubed, we bring that down and subtract one. To the fourth, we saw that pattern, brought it down and less one. So that is the idea that we were going for with this exercise. We'll continue on with this now. But before we do, wanted to backtrack just one step and talk about one that we actually skipped. What if we had a constant? Well, algebraically, it would look like this, where we use our definition of the derivative and our function is now c. Now remember here, we're supposed to be putting x plus h wherever there was an x, but because there isn't, we only put c. And so what this one ends up turning out looking like is, and it looks like we have an issue with that h on bottom, but remember, when direct substitution doesn't work, we did have the numerical, algebraic, and geometric way, which we'll get to the geometric in just a minute. Remember, this arrow means approaching zero, not actually zero. So since we know that this top is zero, and this will be something really, really small, but approaching zero, then we know that this yields an answer of zero. Now, graphically, let me explain that real quick by sketching a quick graph. So again, looking at our function as a constant, where it's some number, technically it's y equals some number everywhere. Now, if you chose three, you chose negative one, whatever it might be, the way that we would graph that is this line. And because that line has a slope that is zero, then that means that there is no rate of change. In other words, pick any point on this line and draw the tangent. It would be that. 
with a slope of zero, which means the slope of all of the tangents, or the derivative, in other words, is also zero. Theorem means that somebody proved it. We just went through the two ways that you can reason through it algebraically and geometrically using our definition of a limit and what we know the limit finds for us. So our answer, whenever we have a constant, the derivative is always equal to zero. We also just found one of the key theorems, that's why I put two stars on each side, that any time we have a power function, an x to a power, then we know the derivative of it is, you take the power down in front and multiply it, and then subtract one to the power. So before we move on to all these other rules, I wanted to give you those two basic ones, very important theorems. We will use them constantly. Thank you. I wanted to focus one more time that the derivative comes from our limit definition. So if you remember early, early on in chapter two, we discussed all the different limit laws. Now I'm only gonna give you three of them, the sum difference and the constant multiple. Do you remember what the other side of these were? What could we do with the limit when we were asked to take the limit as we approach some number a for a function that's either being added, subtracted, or multiplied by some constant? Remember the limits work just the way that we would prefer them to, almost as if we were like distributing them. As well as with constants, we're able to pull it out and just focus on the variables in that function. So if we split the two limits up and either add or subtract, or if we take the limit of the function and bring that constant out in front, we could then just focus on the things that aren't constant, the things that will approach and be affected by it, the x's. And because we know that derivatives come from our limits, see if you can fill in these where we have something similar. The adding and subtracting, but for a derivative, or the multiplying by some constant with the derivative. See if you can come up with the right side of these, otherwise, here they are. And just like we know limits behave, because derivatives are derived from that definition of a limit, then we know that if we have a constant, we can pull it out and just focus on taking the derivative of the function and then still multiplying by it. Same with adding or subtracting. We can take the derivative of each and just do the adding or subtracting to their differentiated selves. So hopefully that explains why the derivatives follow the same rules as our limits, because derivatives are derived from a limit definition of that slope or difference quotient. And lastly, these next two rules are a little bit more involved because when multiplying and dividing, things get a little bit uglier. You knew what followed adding and subtracting, that was multiplying and dividing is what we're gonna do next. And we're gonna get a little fancier with the names. So instead of just multiplying or multiplication, we're gonna call it the product rule, where we have two functions that are multiplied together. Now functions meaning I could put x squared here and a four x cubed here. So sometimes it'll be easier than others to work with, but here's what these are. And again, I will leave the proofs for you to look up on your own. I don't wanna take the time, I don't think it's worth it to go over these. We simply have to memorize them. So here's the product rule. If you didn't see it down at the bottom, it is the first function times the derivative of the second plus, Multiplying, we're gonna do addition. The second function times the derivative of the first. So once again, the first function times the derivative of the second plus the second function times the derivative of the first. Unfortunately, yes, that is how we're going to have to take the derivative of two functions that are multiplied together. And you can guess that the quotient rule is even a little nastier because it has division bar, a fraction. And yes, we will end up with a fraction unless it can be simplified further. 
So using my hint down here, see if you can write it down. If not, here it is. Not our favorite, but we will have to use this throughout. Make sure that you start memorizing the product rule and this quotient rule, which is the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom all over the bottom squared. Don't forget that part. Be surprised. A lot of students do forget it. Remember, you're dealing with the fraction. You're going to end up with a fraction unless you can simplify to cancel stuff out. All right, that's it, my friends. Some differentiation rules, namely the power rule, the constant rule, and the product and quotient. There will be others that we'll add on and explore, but for now, focus on these, pay attention to details, be nice, neat, and organized, and go slow so that you don't make mistakes. Good luck, everyone. I'll see you at section four.